Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to analyze um, the thought, works, and biography of the 17th century Iranian Muslim polymath Mullah Mohsen Feza Kashani. He passed away in 1681 CE, which is equivalent to uh, 1091 Hijri. Um, he was born in Isfahan city in Iran, and uh, he was a 12 year Imam, Shia, Muslim, philosopher, logician, poet, mystic, jurisprudent, muhaddith, and a Quranic commentator during the famous Safavid period. Famous Orientalist Levison uh, writes about uh, Faiz Kashani. He says, Faiz was one of the most eminent Shia scholars and mystics of the 17th century Persia. There was hardly any field of knowledge among the sciences of his day that he did not examine and discuss in his works. Faiz belonged to the famous uh, school of Isfahan, as Sayyid Hussein Nasr uh, names this school. And this school was basically a philosophical school, um, famously known for uh, Mullah Sadra's transcendental uh, theosophy, Hikmat um, al-Muta'aliyah. So his mentors, his teachers were very famous philosophers, actually. Sheikh Bahai, Ola Sadra, Mir Fendreski, Mir Damad, and Allama Muhammad Taqi Majlisi. And uh, he had many, many students, among whom these are the famous ones. Mullah Muhammad Baqir Majlisi, Sayyid Nematullah Jazairi, and Ghazi Saeed Qomi. He was a prolific author. He wrote 116 works in philosophy, Gnosticism, mysticism, poetry, chronic commentary, hadith, natural theology, jurisprudence, and other religious works. Coming to uh, um, the orientation of his thought, uh, faith underscored theological, Gnostic, and philosophical understanding to grasp the Quran and hadith fully. Uh, he advocates combining scripture with reflection to attain true knowledge. Instead of merely relying on philosophical or Sufi thought, alone, he encourages the seekers to pursue this path both through reason, piety, and mysticism. A prominent characteristic of Kashani's thought is um, Sadrian transcendental theosophy, uh, specifically a gradationist unity of existence, gradationist hierarchy of existence, or tashkika wujud. You can see this orientation even in his, in his poetry. Um, there is this famous poem from him, like uh, elegant, beautiful poem. Um, we're going to read this together. I'm going to first uh, read it in Farsi, and then we're going to analyze the English translation um, together. And uh, you will see how he is infusing his gradationist view into in, into his mystic love poetry. کشی جان را به نزد خود ز تابی کفکنی در دل بسان آن که میتابد رسن آهسته آهسته تو را مقصود آن باشد که قربان رهد کردم ربایی دل که گیری جان ز من آهسته آهسته تو عشقت در دلم جا کرد و شهر دل گرفت از من مرا آزاد کرد از بود من آهسته آهسته به عشقت دل نهادم زین جهان آسوده گردیدم گسستم رشته جان را ز تن آهسته آهسته ز بس بستم خیال تو تو گشتم پای تا سر من تو آمد خورده خورده رفت من آهسته آهسته سپردم جان و دل نزد تو و خود از میان رفتم کشیدم پای از کوی تو من آهسته آهسته First we are going to read the English translation and then we are going to analyze it together With gentle art and charm you claimed my heart gradually, gradually and hallowed me out of myself gradually, gradually you draw the soul to yourself, kindling a flame within the heart, much akin to a rope being pulled gradually, gradually. Your aim, it seems, is for me to be a sacrifice on your path, pulling the heart to take my soul gradually, gradually. Your love found home within my heart, its city wholly seized. It liberated me from my existence gradually, gradually. To your love, my heart I gave indifferent now to worldly charm, severing the thread of life from the body gradually, gradually. So deep my contemplation, I became you from head to toe. You came little by little, and I left gradually, gradually. 
To you, my heart and soul, I pledged and vanished from the stage. I retreated from your alleyway gradually, gradually. So as you can see, there is this existential and transformative theme in this poem. And um, importantly, uh, he is constantly tapping on this process being gradually. The Divine Beloved comes gradually. His, uh, he is emptied of himself gradually. He is perfected existentially gradually. Indicative of a Sadrian um, gradationist hierarchy of existence. In the Sadrian gradationist uh, hierarchy of existence, uh, at the top of the hierarchy is absolute existence, the divine essence. And there are multiplicity, multiplicity of existence coming down to the prime matter, the lowest level of existence. There is vertical multiplicity and horizontal multiplicity in, in, in this uh, Sadrian framework. The horizontal involves multiple unique quiddities sharing the same existential plane, retaining their identity while sharing an existence. The vertical encapsulates varying existential ranks from absolute existence at the top of the hierarchy down to the potentiality of prime matter at the base, each level reflecting a different mode of being with varying intensity, perfection, and deficiency. This gradual mode emphasizes different degrees of perfection, culminating in the limitless perfection of the highest level of existence, which is absolute existence. So um, existence is gradational from the lowest level of existence, prime matter, up to the pinnacle. And um, each existence in this hierarchy is striving for perfection. Each one has deficiencies and strive to become perfect, to reduce those deficiencies and attain the perfection of the higher step going up towards the absolute existence. Kashani's poem is emphasizing this gradual perfection, step by step, climbing the ladder. In this ghazal, Fez Kashani implores the phrase gradually, gradually, in Farsi it is aheste, aheste, and little by little, khorde, khorde, to mirror the gradationist hierarchy, indicative of Sadrian uh, philosophy. In the poem, Fez Kashani narrates a progression of self-emptying gradually, gradually, liberation from personal existence gradually, and severing the life threat from the body gradually. This philosophy is most vividly illustrated in this line, my favorite line. Zebas bastam khiyale to to gashtam pai to sarman to amat khurde khurde raft man ahista ahista. I contemplated you so much that I became you head to toe. You came little by little and I left gradually, gradually. A vivid portrayal of the transformation and transcendence. The poem pictures the transition from the material to the spiritual world, self-transcendence and unity with the divine, reflecting the vertical gradation of existence, reflecting the vertical gradation of existence, an upward journey on the ladder of existence. This portrayal illustrates the Sadrian gradationist ontology, reflecting Fais Karshani's philosophical royalty to loyalty, reflecting his loyalty to his master. Now, there is a very important question that needs to be addressed. Was Fais Karshani a Sufi? To answer this question, let us start with the secondary sources um, written about phase and then uh, because there is some misunderstanding there and then we will move on to examining the primary sources that phase himself wrote um, which will clarify the answer to this question. To answer the question whether Feza Kashani was um, a Sufi, let's um, take a look at this chapter from uh, Leonard Lewison. Uh, the chapter's name is Sufism and Society in Safavid Persia um, in the famous The Heritage of Sufism, this edition, which focuses on the Safavid and uh, Mongol period. Louis Saint first uh, examines Sufism in this period. He says, and I quote, uh, one need not search far afield to find the reason why Sufism has been marginalized in the Safavid period. It lies in the crisis of cultural identity experienced by Sufis in the late 17th century Iran, when confronted by an evil even worse than the Kazilbash warriors of Ismail, the rise of the cult of the Usuli, Mujtahids creating 
a trend which amongst its late-day fundamentalist heirs has carried on night down to the present day in Iran. Then he says, unfortunately, the study of the works of Faiza Kashani has been dominated by Sharia-minded Iranian Shiites who portray him as a foe of mysticism and Sufism. Only Luisan is going to contradict himself in the next couple of pages by portraying Faiz as a foe of Sufism, but he does not remember that so far. He will get there. Luisan concludes, the intellectual motivation behind Faiz Kashani's distancing himself from the Sufis near the end of his life remains an enigma. Remember this. It's an enigma, as he puts it. Again, he's going to contradict himself. Uh, well, it is true, there was indeed an unfriendly atmosphere for Sufism in the Safavid period. However, it is critical to distinguish between the genuine aspect of Sufism and pseudo-Sufism. The real Sufism that even Shiite scholars, whom Levison likes to paint as sword-holding devils, and mystics like Feza Kashani acknowledged. Yes, Iran mostly consists of Shia Muslims, but Ibn Arabi, a Sufi scholar, a Sunni Sufi scholar, is read widely in the country. Molana, or some would like to call him Mevlana, Mevlana Rumi was a Sunni Sufi, and he is one of the most popular poets in Iran in the present day. Same about Hafez Shirazi, same about Attar, same about Sheikh Mahmoud Shabesteri. All Sunni, all Sufi is still loved and praised in the Shiite Iran. So Louisan is giving a distorted picture, um, which reflects his uh, bias, which we will see more in this uh, presentation. So um, two things. The real Sufism, which even the Shiite scholars and mystics acknowledge, and the pseudo-Sufism. Louisan is confusing the two, let's hope unwittingly. The pseudo-Sufism is precisely what the uh, Shiite scholars were and continue to criticize. And um, we, will, we will examine that a little bit more in detail. Some of the unhealthy and invented practices of pseudo-Sufism find support neither in the Quran or Hadith, nor a reason, nor rationality. And when you ask them, okay, why would you do this? Like, there is, these things find no place in the tradition. They say, well, these are Sufi things. Uh, they are different. They are distinct from the Quran and Hadith. If something is not in the Quran, not in the Hadith, not in the tradition, and doesn't fit whatsoever with reason, what follows is that, it doesn't belong to the Islamic tradition. It is something invented. Again, I'm not criticizing Sufism. I'm a scholar of Sufism myself, and I practice it. But here we're criticizing pseudo-Sufism. There are radical things done in the name of Sufism, like Shibli is putting salt into his eyes, or some other Sufis live seven years of living in the desert, feeding on thorn. These things find no place whatsoever in the... Islamic tradition. So this is what some scholars, including Faiz Kashani, criticize and reject. And I will give you more quotes and instances of his rejection. If these practices should not be criticized, what should? So Faiz Kashani's reason for distancing from Sufism is not an enigma, as uh, Louisan put it. It is not an enigma. There was an atmosphere of pseudo-Sufism which distance itself from the real Sufism, and that is exactly and precisely what Feza Kashani was um, criticizing. So, um, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with the inner aspects of Islam, when we say mysticism, which is a translation for Islamic spirituality, two general currents come up. One is Sunni Sufism, Tasawwuf, and the other is Shi Irfan. These terms are sometimes used interchangeably, especially Irfan. Irfan is used in both of them. But the general current is Sunni Tasawwuf Sufism and Shi'i Irfan. Shi'is prefer Irfan, Sunnis prefer Tasawwuf. Then again, these are used interchangeably. And here is the um, curious part. Lovisan replaces the latter, that is Sufism, or the former, that is Irfan, at will in his writings, just to make his point come true. Even at times when Faiz Kashani does not use the term Sufi, Lovisan uses it on Faiz Kashani's behalf. For instance, when Kashani speaks of divine scholars, Ulamai Rabbanihin, Lovisan 
takes them as Sufis, not as Arif, plural Rafa, which translates to uh, mystics or Gnostics, which is the common term uh, used for the Shia mystics. So the Shia mystics generally use Erfan. So the person who has the knowledge of Erfan is called Arif, mystic, Gnostic, not a Sufi. Um, but Lewison um, replaces the word with Sufism uh, quite at will. Additionally, when discussing individuals versed both in exoteric and esoteric knowledge, Loisan concludes, there can be no doubt that this group are Sufis, since one of the characteristics of this group is their ecstatic disposition, a trait peculiar to the Sufis in Islamic society. But Loisan does not bother explaining how such people are without a doubt Sufis and not Urafa, that is plural Arif, mystics, Gnostics. These points among many other, some of which we will examine, uh, show a clear bias and distortion of Fais Kashani's assertions and attitude far from academic integrity. Lewison writes, Fais Kashani experienced considerable disillusionment with Sufism and was overtaken in later years by a more critical attitude towards both Tasawuf and Irfan. And here's again the curious point. Here, Lovisan quietly adds Irfan to the list, whereas Fais Kashani does not Peskashani uses the word tasawuf, not erfan. But Luisan says tasawuf and erfan. And it's he's very careful about the usage of these two. Uh, he avoids using erfan. But when it, when there is a negative point he wants to point to, he immediately brings in erfan where Peskashani does not. Not satisfied with Peskashani's orientation, Luisan unleashes his anger and scorn. He says, and I quote, it appears rather hypocritical of Fezika Shani to cite passages from various Sufi authors such as Sanai, Saadi, and Rumi to illustrate his ideas while belittling the Sufism of those very same authors to expound an idiosyncratic type of Islamic mysticism, snobbishly disdaining to acknowledge the validity in Rumi's Sufi, Rumi's Sufi methodology. Um, like, I don't need to tell you that such such uh, language and text has no place in academia, but and, uh, for someone, the level of uh, Louison, it was, this was uh, quite shocking for me that he uses such um, sharp, insulting, scornful words about something that he's mistaken about. He mistakenly ascribes to Fais Kajani that he's not, again, let's hope unwittingly, Fais Kashani endorsed some aspect of Sufi cosmology, though criticizing some others. Here is the crucial, crucial part. Supporting a school of thought partially does not necessarily mean that one should endorse all its aspects, nor does it mean that one is necessarily a member. The same Rumi that uh, Louisan uh, cites, for instance, acknowledges some aspects of Christianity and the high rank of the Prophet Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, but he's not a Christian. Well, just supporting a school of thought, a religion, a tradition, whatever, partially does not mean that you are. You need to obsessively and fanatically um, support all of it, even if um, some practices are radical. So Fais Kashani was neither a hypocrite nor a snob, nor was he belittling Sufism. He was partially supportive and partially critical of Sufism. In his treatise, Al Muhakama, Fais Kashani openly criticizes some Sufis. Here is a quote Objectionable actions emanating from today's so called Sufis who are imperfect ascetics and worshippers include the following. One issue is their practice and pronouncing dhikr very loudly, whereas Almighty God declares in the Quran. And he's going to bring some instances where uh, God in the Quran and Hadith tradition, narration, have made it clear to do such things more softly, more quietly, more elegantly. Chapter 7 of the Quran, verse 205. These are the things uh, Fais Kashani cites. And remember thy Lord within, within thy soul, humbly and in awe, being not loud a voice in the morning and in the evening, and not be among those who are heedless. Then call upon your Lord humbly and in secret. Truly, he loves not the transgressors. Meaning, at Fais Kashani, invoke your Lord with supplication and quietly, for indeed, God does not love those who exceed moderation. To further support his assertion, Kashani cites several hadiths, plural hadith, 
during a journey, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu encountered a valley where he witnessed people elevating their voices in the recital of Tahlil, an Islamic vicar meaning there is no God but Allah. He kindly advised them, utter your divine remembrance softly. Indeed, you invoke not one who is deaf or distant, but one who is hearing, proximate, and present to you. This hadith is sourced in Tafsir al-Safi, which is one of his uh, hadith collection works. Another hadith he cites, in this hadith, the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, says to Abu, Abu Dhar, Remember Allah with a sincere remembrance. I ask, what is sincere here? He said, the secret remembrance. He's citing these narrations and chronic verses to criticize the loud, radical voices some make in the so-called pseudo-Sufi gatherings. Uh, Faith Kashani's further objections include clapping during vicar gatherings, dancing, fainting, and similar actions. He calls such Sufis worship as play, a mockery, not a real one. Nevertheless, and here again is, this is a very important passage that uh, Louison fails or ignores to consider. Um, here, Faiz is uh, defending the Sufis. He says, whenever a few objectionable actions are observed from a group attributed to a sect of the righteous, al haq it is imperative not to generalize the entire sect as malevolent. After all, both commendable and reprehensible aspects can be found within every sect. Faiz even criticizes excessive rebuking and criticizing and accusing Sufi as heresy, calling such accusers and pseudo-Sufis as ignorant. So this is a clear passage, a quote, direct quote from uh, Kashani's, own, Kashani's own works, that he is supporting Sufi cosmology, Sufi metaphysics. And um, he's criticizing those who are excessively criticizing Sufism. Levison appears determined to believe that Fais Kashani should have fanatically endorsed Sufism. And not satisfied with Fais Kashani's inclinations, he, as we saw about, uh, insults uh, Fais, which is not so academic. The Iranian Arif, that is Fais Kashani, explicitly mentions in his uh, treatise Al Insaf that he's an outsider to those theologians, philosophers, and Sufis who do not adhere to the Quran, Hadith, and the teachings of Al Al Bayt, peace be upon them. An assertion demonstrating that Fais Kashani was not a Sufi. He was a Shi'i Arif, but Louisan has quite comfortably skipped over these passages because these are the passages he himself cites in his work. Louisan concludes that Faiz Kashani's quote, mysticism is that of a sober pietist whose sole consolation is the Muslim scripture and the Shi'at canon of Hadith, end quote. This is the spirituality that Louisan, the Orientalist, calls an idiosyncratic type of Islamic mysticism and Faith Karshani's own version of Shiite Sufism. I think at this point, even if someone did not have uh, a good picture of Faith's works by these direct quotations, one would get to the conclusion that Karshani supports Shi'i mysticism and he respects Sufism. He's criticizing pseudo-Sufism. Um, Kashani's mysticism's name is Erfan, a term that is respected in both the sister sects without taking up a sword, trying to uh, belittle, distort, and biasly paint a picture that is not real. Just supporting a group, a school of thought, a philosophy, a tradition, whatever, it doesn't mean that one should fanatically um, endorse it up to the point of death, even if you see that there are some mistakes and, say, some collusions within that tradition. To conclude, Peskashani was an Arif, a scholar, and quite respected towards Sufism, but critical of uh, pseudo-Sufi practices. Now we are going to examine uh, Faiz Kashra and his works, uh, but before we do so, um, there is something unique about Faiz that makes him so special. Those who, are, those who are familiar with the Islamic Hadith tradition, there are generally two, two groups. Uh, the first group are the Usuli, and the second group, the Ikhbari. The Usuli group brings in Ijtihad, they examine the Hadith in a broader context, making comparisons and drawing principles that are not there necessarily in black and white in the Hadith. But the Ikhbari tradition 
are more literal. They pay more attention to the Hadith tradition together with the Quran. Not all of them, but the majority does not resort to philosophy, mysticism, and actually are against it. They only and only, again, not all of them, consider the Hadith and the Quran. They are more literal. But what makes Faiz so fascinating is that despite adhering to the second group, the Ikhbari group, he is quite well versed in philosophy and in mysticism. He has unique attention to the Hadith tradition. He says everything one needs to know is in the Quran and the Hadith. And for him, philosophy and mysticism are means to derive the knowledge from the Quran and the Hadith. But still, despite his strict adherence to the sayings of the Prophet and the Shi'i Imams, generally 14 infallibles, the Prophet, his daughter, and 12 Imams, total 14. In Shi'ism, they are called 14 infallibles. Because according to the Shia sect, they are the possessors of divine knowledge, perfect divine knowledge, hence the term infallibles. Despite Faiz's strict adherence to the 14 infallibles narrations, the Hadith, he pays special attention to philosophy and mysticism. These are some of his works in philosophy and mysticism. I'm not going to be reading them all. Um, you may please pause the video and take a look at the text if you need. I'm just, I'm just going to point to some of them about about which I want to have some explanations. In his treatise, Zad al-Salik, he clarifies the pre prerequisites and steps of this spiritual journey, not the steps of the spiritual journey per se, the prerequisites and the steps that you need to take in that journey. In um, Ilm al yaqin he bases his writing on the Quran, the Sunnah, and narratives of Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them. Ayn al-Yaqeen is more philosophical and technical. Similar works are Haqq al-Yaqeen, Haqq al-Mubin, Jabr wa Ikhtiyar, and Al-Kalamat al-Maknuna. Uh, and this, this latter one, Al-Kalamat al-Maknuna, uh, uh, it's a fascinating book, a bilingual book in Farsi and Arabic, in which he gathers some excerpts from other Gnostics. Usul al Ma'arif, the summary of Ilm al Yaqeen, al Kalamat al Makhdhuna, excerpts from Kalamat al Faiz does something very interesting. He has al Kalamat al Maknuna, uh, the big book about uh, like quotes from Gnostics, then he has excerpts from that book, al Kalamat al Makhdhuna, then he has another excerpt. Ali Ali, and there are actually four versions of Al Kalamat Al Maknuna, but they are not simply excerpts or summaries. There is a great paper written by Zargarf, 2014. The paper is titled as Revealing Revisions, Faith Kashani's Four Versions of Al Kalamat Al Maknuna. In this paper, he argues that, and he shows that, uh, the four versions of Al Kalamat Al Maknuna are not just summaries. Faith uh, carefully adjusts those versions to different intellectual levels, to different people in different intellectual levels. Uh, you may want to read that paper. Usul al-Ma'arif is the summary of Ilm al-Yaqeen, al-Kalimat al-Madnuna, and God's oneness, that is Tawheed. Al-Anwar al-Hikmah is a summary of Ilm al-Yaqeen on more philosophical grounds. Usul al-Aqayid, a philosophical work with references to Hadith. Al-Mashwaq clarifies mystic symbols. Al-Insaf, this is a very interesting treatise, illuminates the path to unraveling the mysteries of faith and certainty, and we come to his works in poetry. I will not read them all. Again, you may please pause and uh, read the names. But I would like to point to uh, Divana Ash'ar in Farsi. This is a magnificent work of poetry. If, honestly, um, you just open one random page show it to someone without saying the name, they wouldn't even recognize whether it's from someone like Rumi or this question name. The poems are very elegant. Next, I would like to uh, draw your attention to Shawq al-Mahdi, in Farsi, Shawq al-Mahdi. It's a collection of poems about the 12th Imam of Shi'ism. Um, interestingly, in the introduction of this work, he says, uh, I wanted to talk to emotionally connect to, invoke the 12th Imam through poetry, and I couldn't find uh, satisfying poetry for that purpose. Then he resorts to one of the uh, great Persian Sufi poets, Hafez. He, well, Hafez does not write poems about 
uh, the 12th Imam, but he, he takes his poems, he takes these styles, he changes the words, he plays with the meanings and uh, turning them, transforming them into poems about the 12th Imam. This is a very interesting and unique work. Currently, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm researching this and uh, there will be a video and hopefully a paper or a book about this soon. His chronic commentaries are Tafsir al-Safi, Hadith-based commentary, and Al-Asfa, and Tamwir al-Mawahib. His Hadith works are the famous Al-Wafi, which is a 15-volume collection of Hadith from the four major Shia Hadith books, namely Qutub al-Arba. The second is Al-Shafi, a collection of prominent Hadith from Al-Wafi. And the third one, Al-Nawadir, which is a collection of Hadith not found in Qutub al-Arba. Khashani's works in theology and other religious studies, again, I'm not going to be reading them all, the first work is a revised version of Al-Ghazali's Al-Ihya Al-Ulum. Al-Kalamat al siriya is a collection of excerpts from Shi Imam prayers. Kalamat al-Tarifa addresses, together with the other two ones, address various Islamic schools of thought and their belief system. It discusses divine knowledge in Al-Lubab and the words creation in Al-Lub. He writes a Persian treatise on principles of religion that is usul al aqaid using the Quran and Hadith without resorting to Kalami methods. And the last two works, Mizan al qiyamah and Mir'at al-Akhirah, center on eschatology. He has works on natural theology, as you see here, and jurisprudence, but I'm not going to get into those. Coming to the secondary works written about phase, uh, the literature is weak. Um, in Farsi, there are some works, not extensive, but still there are some works to begin with. In English, the literature is scarce about Fez Kashani. Seeing this lack, this void, uh, me and my colleagues have been working uh, to produce English papers and books about Kashani's works. I will put the link to two of those papers in the description. There will be more works in the future. Uh, I don't know when you are watching this video, but currently we have published two. They are about divine love, attraction, jazba, mystic intoxication, that is masti in Farsi, and selflessness, bihodi. These two papers examine uh, these matters uh, in the poetry and prose of Feza Kashani in a broader context and examine their implications for the meaning of life. There will be more work very soon. We will turn those papers into videos so you can read the paper or watch the video depending on your preference. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope this video could shed some light on this great thinker's frame of thought. Stay tuned for the next videos.